Hello and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast, a podcast where we talk about why the church is still relevant for us today as we explore themes connected to religion, politics, pop culture, faith, and yes, even the church. Together, we can find out what it means to live into the mission of the church by making disciples. Now, let's get methodical. Hey friends, welcome to episode 6 of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lay, and I'm excited to spend this time talking about how the church is still relevant for us today. Today's episode is entitled, The Sacraments, Part 1, and we are focusing on the sacrament of baptism. And then in episode 7, we're going to spend some time talking about the sacrament of communion. So be sure to be on the lookout for when that episode comes out next week. Before we jump into talking about the sacrament of baptism, though, I want to first start off by addressing the question, what is a sacrament? In his sermon, The Means of Grace, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, says that a sacrament is an outward sign of an inward grace and a means whereby we receive the same. According to Wesley, sacraments represent the grace of God that is given to us as a gift. In the sacraments, God is the primary actor. God is the one who initiates this practice. And God invites us to come and participate in what God is doing. Now, the sacraments are viewed differently depending on what tradition you're coming from. The Roman Catholic Church observes seven sacraments, which include baptism, confession, communion, confirmation, marriage, holy orders, and anointing the sick. But the United Methodist Church, along with other Protestant denominations, observe two sacraments, baptism and holy communion. The two Protestant sacraments of baptism and holy communion are meant to be celebrated publicly in the local church. The celebration of the sacraments is a special invitation for people to participate and accept the gift of God's grace into their lives. Christian baptism is an initiation into the life of the church, and it's an important aspect of the Christian life. Holy communion is a way to celebrate God's love and sacrifice for humankind. And so these sacraments play a significant role in the life of the church. But again, Today, we are focusing on baptism. And baptism is really an initiation. It is a beginning point to a greater journey. There's a great scene in one of my favorite movies, O Brother, Where Art Thou? The movie is a retelling of the Odyssey by Homer, but it's set in Mississippi in the 1930s. And it focuses on these three escaped convicts, Everett, Pete, and Delmar, who were played by George Clooney, John Turturro, and Tim Blake Nelson. While they are uh, running from bloodhounds and prison guards, they come across a whole congregation of people in white robes who are walking toward this muddy lake, singing the song, As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. And then they sing, O sisters, and then O brothers, and O fathers, and O mothers, Let's go down in the river to pray. And suddenly, Delmar, who is moved by emotion, takes off running toward the river. And he splashes his way up to the preacher, and he is dunked and immersed into the muddy water. And soaked from head to toe, he waddles back up to Everett and Pete, and it says, Well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher's done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's the straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting is my reward. Everett is not convinced and quickly says, Delmore, what are you talking about? We've got bigger fish to fry. And then Delmore says, The preacher says all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. And Everett says, I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. And then Delmore responds, Well, I was lying. And the preacher says that that sin's been washed away too. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. And at that point, Pete runs out into the water to be baptized because he wants to experience this amazing grace and forgiveness that Delmore is talking about. And I love this image of baptism. 
being washed in the water of God's redemption and grace. In the United Methodist Church, Christian baptism can be administered in one of three different ways. We do sprinkling, pouring, and of course, like Del Mar experienced, we do dunking or what is often called full immersion. Sprinkling is when water is sprinkled onto the person who is being baptized. And this reminds us of the Old Testament practice of sprinkling blood of the animal sacrifices on the altar, which reminded them of God's covenant with the people of Israel. Pouring is when water is poured over the head of the person who is being baptized. And this usually happens for folks who want more than sprinkling, but are unable to be fully immersed. Immersion is when the person being baptized is completely submerged in water. This reminds us of Jesus' baptism, which took place in the Jordan River. And in the United Methodist Church, we administer baptism in these three ways. But we also accept all Christian baptisms from other denominations. So if you've been baptized in the Episcopal Church or the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church, we acknowledge and accept that baptism as long as as it was administered in the Trinitarian name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism is essentially the initiation into the Christian family, and it is open for those who hear the good news and want to respond and be united with Christ. Although it is important to note that baptism is not required in order to receive God's grace or to become a Christian. So you don't have to be baptized in order to be, quote, saved. Unquote. It doesn't work that way. You can be a believer and a follower of Christ and not ever be baptized. However, baptism for both infants and adults is often seen as the doorway into the Christian life. Infant baptism has a very long history, and it's something that is done in many Christian traditions, including Methodism. Infant baptism is just one expression of God's prevenient grace. And prevenient grace is this idea that God is working in our lives before we even recognize it. In my own life, I can attest to how my baptism as an infant was a way for God's grace to work in my life before I was even old enough to know it. We share in this special moment as we welcome infants and adults into a special communion with God. And baptism is really a way for God to claim us as God's own. God claims you in baptism. From the moment of your baptism, you are officially invited into the family of God. But that being said, it also takes a lifetime to live into the Christian life. The good news is that this is a promise from God that cannot and will not ever be broken. In my home church where I grew up in Cleveland, Tennessee, the choir would always sing a song whenever a baby was baptized. They actually sing it at my baptism. It goes like this. Andrew, Andrew, God claims you. God helps you, protects you, and loves you too. We this day do all agree, a child of God you'll always be. This song and your baptism is a reminder that you are a beloved child of God and a child of God you'll always be. Whether you like it or not, you will always be a child of God. And there may come a time in your life when you will have to make the decision to either embrace Christ or reject Christ. But God's promise is always good, and that's why in the Methodist Church, we will only baptize you one time in your life. Because we believe that God's promise is always good. God's grace is always sufficient. And so maybe we get to a point in our lives where we need to turn back to God and we can recommit ourselves to God, but but the waters of baptism always cover us for life. God will always keep God's claim upon us. God shares this covenant with us. In the United Methodist Church, when we are uh, baptizing somebody, we ask these questions. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord, 
in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. We begin our baptismal covenant answering I do to these questions. And we are invited into a lifetime of living this out. As the Protestant reformer Martin Luther once said, Baptism takes only a few moments to do, but your whole life to finish. The Christian faith is a journey that goes on for an entire lifetime. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul who said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. This life is a process where we continue to renew our covenant with God. We mess up and we continue to be dependent on God as we seek God's forgiveness. And each time God takes us back, each time God offers us forgiveness even when we don't deserve it. Our baptism, which is done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is a promise that nothing we do can ever separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. In his book, Being Christian, Baptism, Bible, Eucharist, Prayer, Roman Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, makes an important connection between Jesus' baptism and our baptism. He writes, Jesus came up out of the water receiving the Spirit and hearing the voice of God. As newly baptized Christians, we too come out of the water, and the voice of God says to us, You are my dearly loved child. When we experience this, we begin our lives in association with Jesus. As baptized Christians, we are called to dig deeper in our faith. We are called to love the unlovable and to reach out to the poor and the oppressed. We're called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus as we seek to live a life of servanthood. And in many ways, baptism does not make your life easier. In fact, I think baptism makes your life much, much harder. I can remember when I was about to finish my freshman year of high school and things were going really great. I woke up one morning and went to school, and it was like any other normal day. And after school, I would normally just go straight home, but on this particular day, my mom and my sister and I decided to go run some errands, and we arrived at the house three hours later than when we would normally have arrived. And that was a mistake that ended up really costing us, because we crept up the driveway And as the garage door opened, we were greeted with a flood of rushing water. And so my mom and I kind of freak out, and we get out of the car, and we go inside to assess the situation. We flew up the stairs, and we found that there was some pipe that had burst in the bathroom upstairs, and water had traveled through the air duct and flooded our entire basement with water. It was like two or three inches deep. Our furniture, our family photos, a lot of our possessions were just completely ruined. And my mom called my dad, who is an, an accountant, and of course it was in the middle of tax season, because it's always in the middle of tax season when anything like this happens. And my mom says, Mark, you need to come home right now. The basement is flooded. And it was about that time that my older sister, who was then a senior in high school, waltzed into the room holding an umbrella and said, Tut, tut, looks like rain. (laughs) And, you know, my mom and I can look back on this story now and laugh, but at the time, it was not a very happy experience. But this story kind of reminds me that water can also be destructive. You know, my mind immediately goes to the story of Noah. The story recounts the time that God God uncreated his creation with a flood that didn't just destroy a basement or family photos. Instead, this flood wiped everything from the face of the earth. A force of destruction made its way across the earth, pushing down trees, washing out vegetation, and wiping out the landscape. You know, it's true. Water can be destructive and harmful. 
I'm also reminded of the decree that Pharaoh made so many years ago back in Egypt. When Pharaoh said, every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile River, but every girl may live. This is a real threat of destruction and death. The Hebrew people are forced to throw their own male children into the Nile River. In the book of Exodus, we are told of one Levite couple in particular that got married. And much to their dismay, the wife became pregnant. Imagine their horror when they give birth and realize that their newborn baby is, in fact, a boy. I imagine that they had spent the last nine months on edge, worrying about this possibility. They knew that this might happen, but now they are confronted with a difficult situation. What will they do? Three months go by. For three months, the mother and father are able to hold and care for their baby. For three months, they are able to sing their son lullabies and rock their baby to sleep. For three months, they hide their child from the outside world. But the time comes where they can no longer keep this baby a secret. Out of papyrus, tar, and pitch, the mother fashions a seaworthy vessel for her child, places him in the rushing waters of the Nile River, and that stream of water swiftly carries the child to none other than Pharaoh's own daughter. She spots the basket, and a maid draws the child out of the water. Therefore, Pharaoh's daughter decides to raise this child as her own, and she gives him the name Moses. Under the threat of death and destruction, the baby Moses is thrown in the water, but it's also the water that carries him to safety. Moses had a death sentence, but the water carried him to new life. Ultimately, Moses grows up and brings about deliverance for the Hebrew people, and it's the waters of the Red Sea that divide as the Hebrew people walk across on dry land. At first, the water poses a threat, much like the water in Noah's story. Water was originally a barrier that trapped the Israelites and left them exposed to Pharaoh's army. However, when Moses lifts his staff and God parted the Red Sea, the Israelites were able to journey through a path that led them to safety. Moses leads his people out of slavery in Egypt, and into the promised land. And so it's through the water that they find deliverance, and it's through the water that Pharaoh's army finds destruction. As one scholar says, Where there had been no hope, God provided a way forward. In baptism, God leads us through the the water to take our place in the continuing story of God's engagement with the people God called to God's service. Through the waters of baptism, God brings forth deliverance. And our baptism is not what saves us, but our baptism symbolizes God's deliverance and grace that saves us from our sins. John the Baptist had a message that said, This world is not how it should be. There is sin and pain and destruction in your life. And so come to the waters of the Jordan River and I will baptize you. Come and be baptized. Repent and believe. And out of the threat of destruction, there comes deliverance. And this deliverance is found in Christ. In the Gospels, we see Jesus travel from Galilee to the Jordan River, and there is no question that Jesus is the one whom John the Baptist had been prophesying about. And we know this just by the way that that John greets his cousin, Jesus. Jesus has come to be baptized by John, but John responds by saying, you want me to baptize you? Uh, You know, shouldn't it be the other way around? I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, so why are you coming to me? And this is a pretty interesting question that has brought about much debate. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? After all, Jesus was sinless. He didn't need repentance, and yet, he still submitted himself to be baptized. He did this, perhaps, as a way to identify and begin the work 
that was before him. Jesus really was the only one who didn't need to be baptized in order to be cleansed, but Jesus submitted himself anyway, perhaps as a way to set an example for the rest of us. Jesus essentially tells John, this baptism should be done because God requires it. This moment of Jesus' baptism is a special one. Jesus is dipped in the water and the heavens open up and the Spirit descends like a dove, and then the voice of God calls out for everyone to hear, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're present and accounted for, ordaining Jesus and His ministry. And so this is not your ordinary baptism. Now there is no question as to who Jesus is. I love what retired Bishop Will Willimon says about this moment. He writes this, Through much of the Gospels, Jesus can be enigmatic. Jesus tells these cryptic and incomprehensible parables. Who can understand them? But here, in this moment, the veil is pulled back. There is a voice all the way from heaven. And we hear, You are my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. In Matthew's gospel, this voice isn't in Jesus' head. The voice is heard by the people. This audible voice is given for their benefit so that they might know that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Now, I wish I, I could have seen some reaction shots of the people around when God's voice beamed out of the sky. I wonder if the people in attendance that day ever thought about that moment, especially the religious leaders. When they begin to plot to kill Jesus, did any of them stop and say, Hold on, wait a minute. Remember that time God called down from heaven and basically gave Jesus his endorsement? You know, maybe it's not a good idea to try to get him killed. I wonder what people thought when they witnessed this marvelous moment. Did it inspire them? Did it scare them? Did it have an impact on them? I think any time we encounter... God, it's a miraculous thing. And I truly believe that baptism is one of those moments for us. Now, I don't know of anyone who had a baptism that was quite as special as Jesus' baptism. But still, we share in this special moment as we welcome infants and adults into a special communion with God. And baptism is a way for us to be included in the family. Being baptized is an opportunity to have a fresh start. We're called to repent and to come down to the river. We're called to experience this special sacrament as we commune closer with God. Just before the Passover festival, Jesus gathered with his disciples. And after sharing a meal with them, Jesus stood up and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin. And with a washcloth in that basin, he began to wash each of his disciples' feet. One by one, he poured water over their feet as a servant. And then he leaned in front of Peter, but Peter protested and he said, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus replies, well, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus essentially tells Peter that if he wants to be his follower, then he must let Jesus wash him clean. So Peter responds, Lord, then don't just wash my feet, but wash my hands and wash my head as well. Peter was able to realize his need of Christ as his Savior. You know, there are times where we might feel trapped in our own sin. We may feel the full weight and gravity of our sin upon our own shoulders. And perhaps... We feel like we've been confronted by our sin and guilt. Perhaps we feel unworthy of finding deliverance. But in our baptism, we can find deliverance. The water that has washed over us in our baptism symbolizes God's deliverance of our sins. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River And from there he went out into the wilderness. And after his baptism, Jesus began his journey. And in our baptism, we are invited to start our journey as well. Our baptism acts as an initiation into the Christian faith. Our old self is washed away and a new self is born in Christ. 
Just like that basin of water Jesus used to wash his disciples' feet, the water of baptism washes away our sinful past and puts us on the path with Christ. God gives us a new promise. God makes with us a new covenant. God makes us into a new creation. John Wesley refers to baptism as a new birth. Wesley offers three characteristics that mark this new birth, based on 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 13, which says this, When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Baptism is the first step in us growing up in our faith. After baptism, we are to put away childish things and seek the marks of the new birth. The first mark of the new birth is faith. And this journey begins with the profession of our faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the definition of what faith is. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Faith is a crucial aspect of the Christian life. And when we profess our faith, we make a promise that we will work to strive to be faithful to the church and to God. The second mark of the new birth is hope. As Christians, our faith in Jesus Christ brings us hope. We don't have to live in despair because we are a people of hope. We don't have to let the difficult and painful times in life allow us to spiral into a fit of depression and rage. In troubled times, we can remember that our faith is here and we can cling to hope in Jesus Christ. The third mark of the new birth is love. The whole gospel of Jesus Christ is based upon a message that revolves around love. God created you and formed you out of the dust. God breathed life into you. God created you in God's image. And God did all of these things out of love. Jesus came to this earth to respond to our sin because God loves us. Jesus preached a message that tells all people to love God and to love our neighbors. Jesus practiced love toward the marginalized and the outcast. Jesus suffered and died on a cross, then rose again because of love. So baptism is an introduction. Baptism is a new birth. And so as you grow in Christ, may you also grow in faith, hope, and love. Anne Apple tells the story of when she was visiting an old war veteran who was under hospice care. He was holding on to each breath, not really able to let go, not able to die. He gathered his strength and he uttered his question, this question that had been on his mind. He uttered this question to Anne. Do you think it matters? Do I think what matters, she replied. And then the old man began to sob as he thought about his past. He still remembered the events that occurred in a time of war, even though it was long over. And that question was still on his mind. Will God forgive me? Will God forgive me? Whenever we feel like we are not worthy, Whenever we feel like God cannot forgive us of something we have done, whenever we feel like we don't belong, Martin Luther invites us to remember our baptism. There were times when Luther felt like he was being attacked by Satan. There were times where he strayed from that baptism. There were times when he forgot that he belonged to God. And whenever that happened, Luther was known for yelling out, I am baptized. Luther would remember his baptism as a way to remind himself that he belonged to someone greater than himself. 
He belonged to someone who baptized with fire and the Holy Spirit. And so it's true. God does forgive us of our sins without any work on our part. But if you are baptized, then you are called to something more. You're called to take that next step and to live out the Christian life through the marks of the new birth. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, I hope you might consider heading on over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review of the show. It is very much appreciated. And until next time, stay methodical.